I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. Sometimes it takes a different approach to help you unlock your true potential. Capella University's game-changing FlexPath format helps you learn at your own pace and fit earning a degree into your life. From before you enroll to after you graduate, you'll be supported by people who are invested in your success so you can pursue your goals knowing that help is available if you need it. Imagine your future differently at capella.edu. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network. Today on the James Altucher Show. I don't want people to make the perfect transition the enemy of the good. Because what is important is to begin with micro steps. And um, even if you begin five minutes before you're going to turn off the light, just begin somewhere. Nobody is ever going to do anything perfectly. I mean, we had a homeless teenager write a piece that Harvard happened to read, and their admissions office offered him a place at Harvard, and he's now in his third year. It's one of my favorite stories about the magic of the Internet, how you can bring people together who otherwise would not know of each other's existence. So I'm here with Ariana Huffington. Ariana, how are you doing? I'm doing great. I got my eight hours sleep. Did you? I did get eight hours sleep. And you know, we're going to talk about the sleep, your book, The Sleep Revolution, Transforming Your Life One Night at a Time. I do want to talk about a couple of other issues first, yes, if that's okay. of course. But I loved your book. I am a pro sleeper. Like I will do anything I can to sleep eight, nine hours a night. Nine hours is good for me. I feel I need nine. Is that okay? Well, you think it's too much? I think, no, no. As they say, unless you are narcoleptic or severely depressed, you can overeat, but you cannot oversleep. That's good to know. And so, you know, oh, here's another quick question I have yeah. before getting into everything. Sometimes I try this, and I used to do this more as a serious experiment, but now I only do it occasionally. Four hours in the afternoon, four hours at night. You think if I divide it in two, is that okay? Well, here is what uh, science says that get, completing all the cycles of sleep um, requires seven to nine hours for the vast majority of people. You know, you may be needing nine hours, I need eight, that's my optimal, somebody else may need seven, unless you have a genetic mutation. If you have a genetic mutation, then you can do great with four or five hours. About 1% of the population has that mutation. You can test yourself, but really you don't really need to test yourself. You know that. You wake up in the morning and you feel completely recharged. But what about if within a 24-hour period I do two phases of sleep? So Why would you do that? Uh, sometimes if I'm staying out late and uh, I'm just hypothetically saying, if let's say I go to sleep from 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. and then from 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. It's definitely not optimal. Okay. Because when you wake up in the morning, 
you're not going to be fully recharged. I see. So you're going to have those hours until you go back to sleep. Where I feel tired. That where you're going to feel tired. And for me, any any hour of your day when you feel tired is really an hour when you're not living life to the fullest, when you're not fully vital, fully present, fully joyful. Well, well, I want to talk much more about the book, and it's it's an important book for people to read, but I feel like I would be wasting a little bit of time here if, I mean, you're Ariana Huffington, your name is iconic, the Huffington Post. I want to kind of, I always look for the secret origins of my superhero, so I want to kind of go back to the fact that I'll let you know, I just bought a book for $156 on Amazon, $156, your book from 1974, The Female Woman, <laughs> is on sale on Amazon for $156, I bought it. Yeah, I could have given it to you for free. No, 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 an author deserves to get paid, although I am sure it's <laughs> just sure some I'm collector. I'm sure I'm not being paid anymore yeah. <laughs> for The Female Woman. <laughs> so you've been active and, and you've, you know, active in writing and in media and in public life for so many years, and you've reinvented yourself constantly. You've had your ups and your downs. You've reinvented yourself constantly. What, obviously, something is driving you that has catapulted you to success on each new reinvention. What What do you, what, what has been this driving force since you were a, a young woman? And you're still obviously a very young woman, but... Uh, I'm no longer a young woman, <laughs> but I, I credit... Um, my mother for a lot of things because she always made my sister and me feel, even though we're living in a one-bedroom apartment in Athens without any money, she always made us feel that we could aim for the stars and that if we failed, she wouldn't love us any less and that failure, she used to say, is not the opposite of success but a stepping stone to success. So a lot of it for me had to do with... um, Pursuing things I loved, things I wanted to learn about. You know, I've written 15 books. They're all very different. They're often about things that I'm exploring, and then I'm sharing my discoveries with my readers. And the Huffington Post was born because I really love bringing people into conversations, and I could see conversations were moving online. And a lot of some of the most interesting people I know we're not going to be online unless we made it super easy for them. And that's what the Huffington Post did. And so it everything springs from um, what I'm experiencing, what I'm learning, and how do I present it to the world. Well, and a lot of it, though, has been through reinvention over the years. Like, you've gone from book writing to um, television personality to politics, and for politically you've changed... What has what what has been kind of a low moment through these that that resulted in a profound let's say a change that really catapulted you to a next level of success? Because often we achieve success from a bottom. And wh- when it, when have you found yourself like thinking, "Oh my God, I can't believe I'm going through this again"? There were always low moments uh, when uh, you mentioned my first book, which was a big international bestseller, and I was 23, so it all came really fast. And then my second book, which was on the crisis in political leadership, because that's what I was interested in, uh, was rejected by 36 publishers. And I ran out of money, and um, I was living in London at the time, and I remember sort of walking down St. James's Street rather depressed, um, wondering if I was following the right profession, and whether I should do something else. And I walked into Barclays Bank just on a whim and asked to see the manager and asked for a loan. And he gave it to me, even though I had no assets. And Why? That wouldn't uh, happen now. <laughs> well, I know. It was just one of those gifts that the universe gives you. I felt a little bit like in fairy tales, you know, when sometimes you, you have the... Um, um, hero or the heroine lost in a dark forest and little animals appear to guide them through the forest. Well, I felt that um, bank manager was like a a little helpful animal helping me through a a dark period in terms of decision-making about my life. And so they gave you that loan. What happened then? What did you do with the money? And then, you know, it made it possible to keep things together for a little longer until I finally got an acceptance and the book was published and it meant I stayed on the path of being a writer, which is what I did most of my life 
um, until I launched the Huffington Post, and then I've continued writing books while editing the Huffington Post. Well, let's talk about um, the Huffington Post. That it seems like originally your your motivation for I don't know if this was your motivation or not, but it seemed like a good way for you to launch the Huffington Post was to get your celebrity or not celebrity but powerful friends together to write it was a way for you to actually interact with them like it was a good excuse for you to call all these people and say hey write for my website and that that seems like a good way to launch a site many people try to launch successful popular sites but are unable to you obviously had a great technique for launching a site which is to get well-known people to write for it well the Huffington Post was from the beginning a combination of being a journalistic enterprise where we as we became profitable, I started uh, hiring more and more reporters, editors. We now have over 800 in 15 countries, but also a platform that um, invited people, some very well known, as you mentioned, some not at all known, to share their stories, to share their opinions. And um, we now have over 100,000 bloggers and we are... Um, developing a new product to make it easier to blog on HuffPost and um, hoping to get to one million quickly. And uh, that for me is um, as exciting as um, earning a Pulitzer because of our journalism. I love the most amazing voices um, that we give a platform to at HuffPost. I mean, we had a homeless teenager write a piece that Harvard happened to read and their admissions office offered him a place at Harvard and he's now in his third year. It's one mm. of my favorite stories mm. about the magic of the internet, how you can bring people together who otherwise would not know of each other's existence. Was there ever a point with the Huffington Post where you felt, oh my gosh, this might not work out? Oh, at the beginning, yes. I mean, <laughs> the reviews were not very favorable. I remember on a, on day one, uh, one of the reviews was the Huffington Post is the movie equivalent of Gili, Ishtar, and Heaven's Gate all rolled into one. That's uh, pretty harsh. Yeah, absolutely. But um, I really believed in the vision. I had a great co-founder in Kenny Lair, um, a great um, chief technology officer in John Peretti who went on to build BuzzFeed. So we had a great team. And as you know, having been an entrepreneur, teams are very important. Um, especially during the hard times. And how did you how did you personally deal with the hard times? Like, what, did you get anxious? Did you get afraid? Oh my, what, what am I going to do next? Like, what? Did, how are you dealing with it? I've always had a spiritual side to my life. I've always um, had this belief that, um, as Rumi said, live life as though everything is rigged in your favor. Mm. And I've. I've had so much experience in my life of things that seemed really dark that turned out to be the best thing that could happen. Like what? Like when uh, a man that I was in love with in my 20s that I was with for seven years, didn't want to have children, didn't want to get married, and I really wanted to have children, so I left him and moved from London to New York. So everything that has happened to me in this country, you know, being married and having my wonderful daughters, having um, uh, my career, the Huffington Post, my friends, everything happened because, in a sense, a man wouldn't marry me and I moved continents. So I, I really believe that very profoundly. So it doesn't mean that you don't get anxious or afraid, but um, one of my favorite lines, again, from my mother, is that fearlessness is not the absence of fear. But uh, moving on, despite your fears. Hmm. So, so speaking of the Huffington Post and moving on, you did sell it for a nice sum, but you're still with the Huffington Post. Like, how have you seen m many founders after they sell their company, and after a year or two, they leave the company, they move on to different things. You've stuck with it. You keep, continue to build it. How have you seen your life change since basically selling the company and and making a significant amount of money and you know living out the dream? So always the agreement was that it would continue running the Huffington Post. Mm. And um, I've, a few months ago, I signed another four-year contract. And um, the great exciting thing is that the Huffington Post keeps changing so much so it doesn't feel like I'm running the same company uh, because, first of all, our global expansion has been so significant. 
Um, we are all over Europe, in Japan, in South Korea, in Australia. Um, we launched an Arab edition. So that has been a very exciting extension of what we're doing. Uh, video has become more and more important. So um, also what we're doing in the wellness section um, has become more and more prominent ever since 2007 when I collapsed from sleep deprivation and um, started discovering the importance of sleep, which led to the writing of the Sleep Revolution. But long before the writing of the Sleep Revolution, we launched a dedicated sleep section hmm. at the Huffington Post. So um, we we feel that increasingly we are adding value to our readers' lives uh, by both, of course, covering news and politics and covering solutions to our problems but also by covering how we can live our lives with less stress and more fulfillment pretty relentlessly. And, you know, it's funny. So 2007, you, you collapsed from sleep deprivation, and which, as you mentioned, led to the, the writing of the book, The Sleep Revolution. Uh, you, you were so successful, and you've been so driven all of these years. At, why do you think you were feeling, oh my gosh, I still can't sleep, I still have to keep moving like sleep deprivation is 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 not a, a disease it's a symptom the right. disease is some sort of internal motivation where you feel like you're going to be considered weak or not as prolific if you don't just stay awake and keep working so what was it what was it causing you what insecurity was causing you to keep moving forward rather than sleep when you needed to i think it's actually something else i think there is a collective delusion that we are all suffering from uh, that sleep deprivation is essential for achievement. And uh, that's a, a delusion that millions of people have now discovered are suffering from. It really goes back to the first industrial revolution. In the book, I have an entire chapter on the history of how we came to believe something scientifically false. And um, during the first industrial revolution, we started believing that um, we actually are like machines, effectively. And the goal with machines is to minimize downtime. Now, human beings are not set up like machines. So that's um, what became, um, for me, the big turning point, you know, after my collapse, when I studied the science of sleep, which I wasn't aware of, and realized that uh, sleep deprivation was, in fact, the new smoking. But but I, I'm gonna I'm gonna call you a little on this because I don't believe it was just a societal thing, because you yourself are incredibly driven. What was causing you to feel you needed to stay awake so that to the point where you collapse from sleep deprivation? Not everyone collapses. You were very successful in depriving yourself so much of sleep that you, right. you collapse from it. So it's not you kind of take things to extremes in every direction. I this is your is, personality. I think it is a combination of. Um, a sort of perfectionism, which made me um, believe that, you know, I was building the Huffington Post. It was two years into launching it. Um, we were growing. I felt I really had to be um, making every decision, making sure everything was perfect. And at the same time, I had two teenage daughters and I was a single mom, so I also wanted to be the perfect mother because I believed I did have the perfect mother. And what, um, as I say in the introduction to the sleep revolution, what really uh, happened just before my collapse was that I was on a college tour with my oldest daughter, Christina, and we were going around the country from college to college for her to decide what colleges she was going to apply to. And our ground rule was mommy was not going to be on her phone, was not going to be on her laptop. And that meant that really I could not work during the day. I was with my daughter all day. And then I was. Was that stressful to you? Like, because, like you say, two years yes. into launching a company, you were probably getting a thousand Absolutely. texts a day. Yeah. So what would happen is that she would go to sleep when we would check into a hotel and I would start working. So that went on for a week. And I think it was really that. Um, that prompted um, the collapse. So I think what I learned um, is that 
in the end, we are not the best we can be, either at work or with our families, if we don't first, as they say on aeroplanes, put our own oxygen mask first. Let's stop to take a quick break. We'll be right back. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to or these different sports to to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So, I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But people in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one -on -one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a Masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Membership started at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one -on -one classes with all 180 plus masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180 plus masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So this holiday season, you can give one annual membership 
and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. You can crush your fingers and all your toes during a data center migration. You can knock on wood, pluck a dozen four-leaf clovers, or look to your lucky stars for a successful office expansion. You could hold your breath, shut your eyes, and say all the world wishes to help avoid cyber attacks. But none of that truly helps you. Because Next Level Moments need the Next Level Network. With the security, reliability, and expertise to take your business further. AT&T Business, the network you can rely on. Sleep is a third of our lives, and yet people discount it so much. It, you know, so much in literature over the past several hundred years has kind of suggested that sleep is a, a waste of time as opposed to an incredibly important piece of time that we should pay attention to. So let, let's just get right into it. Your book's great. It gives so many different formulas of advice and, on, on why sleep is important and, and how to get sleep. Uh, first off, what are the main benefits of sleep? I just, I'll get right into it. So... So the benefits fall into three categories. The first is health. You know, sleep is um, the foundation of our health. You know, we've convinced the world that nutrition and exercise are key to our health, and they are. But the first pillar is sleep, nutrition, exercise. These are the three pillars. So um, if we don't get enough sleep, our immune system is suppressed which means we are much more susceptible to all the viruses that are around us anyway. And um, we all know anecdotally when we are run down, we are more likely to catch a cold. We are more likely to get the flu. Well, that is science. It's not just <laughs> that uh, it's not an accident. Uh, or our inflammatory biomarkers are up. We are more likely to put on weight because sleep deprivation activates the hormones that make us crave all the wrong things, carbs, sweets. Um, we are, as a result, more likely to become obese. So there's a connection between sleep deprivation, obesity, and diabetes. We are more likely to be stressed. So there is a connection between hypertension and heart disease, a connection with cancer. And one of the recent findings that I find absolutely fascinating is um, what happens to our brain when we sleep. Because when we sleep, it's a time of frenetic activity in the brain. And contrary to what we used to think, that sleep was a time when we uh, effectively put the car in the garage and turned the ignition off, um, sleep is the time when we wash away the toxins that have built up during the day. What does that mean? Because it uh, so it's a metaphor, but what is actually happening? Well, literally, um, there are toxins that build up among the cells in our brains, and uh, if they are not cleaned up during the night when we sleep, they accumulate. And one of the side effects is um, difficulty consolidating memories and ultimately Alzheimer's. Mm. Um, in fact, Dr. Nedergaard, who um, was the scientist behind a lot of these findings, had a great metaphor. I don't know why sleep scientists are amazing with metaphors, but she said... Because they sleep more, so their brain puts together more, connections yeah. better. <laughs> but she said that um, the brain um, can either be alert and awake or asleep and cleaning up. She said it's like you can either entertain the guests or clean the house. And so that's really what happens. And that's the health mm. Um, part. The second part is productivity, and that's kind of very ironic because a lot of the reasons, as we said earlier, that people sacrifice sleep is because they think they're going to be more productive if they don't sleep. Well, the truth is that we are not, that um, we are much uh, um, less able to make good decisions. We are much less able to see creative solutions through problems. Um, we are not as engaged in what we are doing. In fact, uh, we are working harder. We are working longer hours. But last year, we lost 11 days of productivity mm. because of sleep deprivation. Well, 
Let me ask you this, though. Take countries where uh, the siesta is a part of the culture, like, I don't know, Spain, Mexico, some of these kind of more Latin countries. How would you compare the U.S. economy to their economies in terms of productivity, given that we are sleep-deprived and they're sleeping more? Well, it doesn't mean they sleep more. I come from one of these countries. Mm -hmm. They're terrible habits Mm -hmm. that are changing. But when I was growing up in Greece, you know, people would go to dinner at 11 o'clock at night, Then they would go straight to sleep on a full stomach, which, as you know, is not a good thing to do. Uh, Then they would wake up, have a cup of coffee and a biscuit, no breakfast. And um, then they would have lunch at one and go to sleep (laughs) on a full stomach. Uh, I don't think this is really the most effective way of living. Uh, Uh, It's it's very different if you... um, are tired for whatever reason, you're jet-lagged, your child was sick and you stayed up at night and you have a nap. That's a very different thing than having a life which is structured around having heavy meals light at night or in the middle of the day and then going straight to sleep. You know, it's interesting about the sleep in the brain. I was reading about Carl Icahn, the hedge fund manager. He would, you know, because of this this aspect that uh, we have will pl- willpower depletion when we don't sleep. So we start off the day with a certain amount of willpower and we lose it by the end of the day. So he would schedule his negotiations at the end of the day and then he would sleep all day, go <laughs> into the room. The other side would have been up all day so they have no more willpower and he would be at his peak willpower. So he used sleep as a negotiating <laughs> tactic, which I think was very interesting. I think it's fascinating. I think um, it's really interesting to hear of this example or to hear of athletes who use sleep as a performance enhancer. You know, Andre Nguidala, I have a whole section uh, on the bo- in the book about him because uh, um, he tracked his um, career with the Golden State Warriors and how his stats dramatically improved when he started getting eight hours sleep, which is what he needs. And it's just phenomenal. He became an MVP um, at the NBA, and he um, had somebody take a picture of himself with his award while sleeping, kind of giving credit where credit is due. Now, that is kind of a very, very new information. Um, The fact that there is such a direct connection between performance, whether it's in... Uh, financial negotiations or on the court or in the field in any area of our lives. Okay, so so let's say I'm listening to this and now and I want my life to be better. I wanna I want my brain to be smarter. How do I um, sleep better? What should Great. I do? Fantastic. First of all, I'm so glad you structured our conversation this way because that's how I structured the book too. First, you have to understand the crisis. Then you have to understand the science. You have to change your mind about why it matters. Because if you go straight to changing your habits, it's not going to work until you really convince yourself of why it matters. Mm. I love also the history section because it helps you understand why are we believing something which is simply crazy and false. And then you see that, hey, cultures have believed false things for many, many eras. Well, even in that also, you, you go heavily into the um, importance of dreams, which... Yes, uh, and then we have the section on dreams because dreams are critical. They, um, they help us consolidate our daily experiences. They help us um, come up with new ideas, new insights, um, And And you think it's important for people to write down their dreams, to kind of have the piece of paper and pen next to your bed. As soon as you wake up... Write it down. Yeah, write it down. Think about it, say, write it down. Nobody is ever going to do anything perfectly. But if you have it next to you and there is a dream that you want to capture, you write it down and then that helps you remember your dream. So that's kind of all the first section of the book. And then the second section is the answer to your question of, so how do we do it? And and what is amazing and why I'm an optimist is that there are so many things at our disposal. It's like there's a whole array of things we can do. And unfortunately, we have lost that, that basic wisdom about how we put ourselves to sleep. And instead, when people have the slightest problem uh, going to sleep, they, they, get, they get a sleeping pill. Um, which becomes really uh, dangerous in terms of the long-term consequences if it becomes a chronic dependence. Let me ask you about that. Uh, Will, given the importance of sleeping, and sleeping pills range from, let's say, Ambien, 
to painkillers to anti-anxiety medication, depending on what is causing people to stay awake. Do the benefits of going to sleep ever outweigh the negatives of the medication? Well, there, is, there are so many alternatives, including cognitive behavioral therapy. If you have, if you are suffering from hardcore insomnia. Uh, which has been as effective as any sleeping pill in in helping people go to sleep. We just have to prioritize um, taking the steps that will get us to sleep. But for most people, what is needed and is not happening in most of our lives is a transition to sleep. So, so tell me about that. What's when should it start in the day? And it's also related to exercise and food. Like you said, you can't you can't have a full meal and then instantly go to sleep. That will be unhealthy as well. So, so what? When does it start? When does the sleep preparation start? And and how do we do it? Well, first of all, let me just say that I don't want people to make the perfect transition the enemy of the good, because what is important is to begin with micro steps. And um, even if you begin five minutes before you're going to turn off the light, just begin somewhere rather than trying to create the perfect uh, preparation for sleep and you don't do it. So let's say you're just starting. Pick a time. You know, mine is 30 minutes before I go to sleep. But you're, start. You're, you're far better than me. I, I you honestly, do two hours, right? Um, I'm already thinking about sleep tonight, and it's only <laughs> noon today. So I sleep is all day for me. So you know, you have to decide what works for you. But for somebody who now, as most people do, is on their phone until the last minute, answering texts and emails, and then puts the phone on the nightstand and turns off the light. For that person, I'm sure there are many people listening to us now who are that person. <clears throat> it doesn't matter. Start five minutes, 10 minutes before you're going to turn off the light. Turn off all your devices, laptops, smartphones, iPads, everything, and gently escort them out of your bedroom. That is the first key. It's like a clear demarcation line between your day life and your sleep. And our smartphone is the portal to our life. Hmm. So after that, what has been absolutely invaluable for me is having a hot bath with Epsom salts and flickering candles around. But if you around, but if you don't want a bath, have a hot shower. There is something wonderful about water, kind of washing away the day, and um, beginning to slow down the brain and wind us down. I also love kind of rekindling the romance with sleep. So wearing dedicated sleep clothes, you know, pajamas or night shirts or night dresses or even special t-shirts, just not the things we wear to the gym, which is how I used to go to sleep every night. And then going to bed, by now the, the, nights are, the lights are lower. Um, if you have um, blackout shades, great. If you don't have an eye mask nearby, um, lo- the temperature for me, the ideal temperature is about 67 degrees, but anything between 60 and 70 degrees. And in bed, I read physical books that have nothing to do with work. I read novels, I read uh, philosophy, I read poetry. No iPad because the photons shooting out of the the exactly. screen are bad for you. The whole blue light thing. And also there's something wonderful about the tactile nature of books, you know, just holding a book. And even, in fact, I would consider it a personal victory if your listeners are reading The Sleep Revolution and it puts them to sleep. And then, you know, this wonderful moment when you just literally let the book drop on the floor and you turn off the light. Um, And I love to to do the the final thing I do uh, to be about what I'm grateful for from that day. So I write down three things I'm grateful for. They don't have to be big things, but it's really giving the closing scene of the day to the good things rather than all the setbacks and the problems. And every life in includes both. So the question is, are you going to go to sleep thinking of all the things you're anxious about, the things that you didn't do well, the things you are worried about the ne- for the next day, or are you going to go to sleep grateful for the good things? I think that's a that's a great idea, and um, I'll tell you one trick I do because part of the problem with 
sleep is not going to sleep, but for many people waking up at that right. three in the morning witching hour, like with all those anxieties. And so what I always tell myself is, okay, this is something that always happens to me. I'm going to schedule a time at three in the afternoon to think about these anxieties. I'm not going to think about them now. And then I'm able to go back to sleep. And by three in the afternoon, I realize, oh, those were just those middle of the night anxieties right. that aren't real. Yeah, I think finding, first of all, waking up in the middle of the night is not a problem at all in itself. It's the fact that we start stressing and worrying and have a hard time going back to sleep because segmented sleep, as it's called, has been part of um, human lives for um, for centuries. Um what I, what I do when I wake up in the middle of the night, if I can't go to sleep right away, is I meditate. So I prop mm-hmm. myself up in bed and I meditate. And it's just absolutely amazing because, first of all, I love having this unlimited time to meditate and it invari- invariably puts me to sleep. Uh, if you're not a meditator, I have in the book an, um, an appendix with 12 of my favorite meditations. And you can play one or two or three of them, I promise you, you're going to find at least one that you'll never hear to the end because it will put you to sleep. It's so funny because so many people uh, so many people say, oh, I can't meditate, I always fall asleep. But that's the exact idea exactly. here. Exactly. <laughs> you meditate and fall asleep. And Perfect. I forgot you mentioned in the book, somebody said, uh, sl- oh, the Dalai Lama said, sleeping is the best meditation. Yes, exactly. So- the, the, the Dalai Lama actually sleeps for eight hours, but goes to bed very early and then wakes up in the middle of the night and and meditates. So when I wake up in the middle of the night, I feel great, you know, the Dalai Lama and I are meditating now. And uh, my sister, whom you know, Agapi, and I um, wrote a meditation that she recorded, and it's on the website of the book, arianahuffington.com. So you can download it, but not on your smartphone, remember, because your smartphone isn't going to be anywhere near you. Just get a little dedicated iPod. I have a dedicated sleep iPod, and it has the meditation that Agapi, my sister, and I did. It has meditations that I love, and it has soft music. Everything that has to do with my sleep is on this iPod. So that way, I'm not tempted to go to things that have nothing to do with sleep but with my daily life on my smartphone. So, so let me ask you this. So you've, you've transformed your sleep life, which obviously has transformed you know, your level of well-being and so on. You've also uh, had great success with this company, which you sold and you're still involved with and getting incredible satisfaction from. Do you feel uh, after kind of all these years of, of the good fight that you're happy or at least feel some level of, of well-being in your life? Yes, I feel incredibly grateful. And the third thing that I, we started talking about health and productivity, the third thing is relevant to your question, which is um, bringing joy into everything I'm doing. And that for me is is so important. And so often when, when, when we are sleep deprived, I can, I, I, I can guarantee you it's true of all of us. Um, we really live our lives in a in a way that is purely transactional, like getting things done, rather than being fully present and grateful and joyful. And right now, I don't want to live my life that way. And in fact, I can't stand myself when I'm sleep deprived because it makes me moody, it makes me more irritable, it makes me less creative, and it definitely makes me less less joyful. So bringing joy into my life is a big priority because I feel... What What is joy? Joy for me is like uh, being fully engaged in what I'm doing, being fully grateful, not taking anything for granted. Life is incredibly fragile. Um, I had a friend of mine who launched a company, 32 years old. She's she was like a big success at Facebook, Google, Snapchat, and then lost, uh, launched her own company. Um, I'm an investor. We all investors got an email from her how she was diagnosed with aggressive breast cancer and um, after a double mastectomy was diagnosed with aggressive ovarian cancer. So mm-hmm. she was closing down the company. That email immediately reminds you of how life changes from one moment to the next. And this moment is all we have. And my mother always used to say, don't miss the moment. And when you're exhausted, you miss the moment. 
because you are just living in some fog, either of um, the past or the future. So, so Ariana Huffington, you've given so much valuable advice. Such a pleasure once again on my podcast because you were on after you wrote Thrive. And um, this is the first time that we're meeting in person. So I'm happy to finally meet. And uh, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me on. For more from James, check out the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network at jamesaltucher.com and get yourself on the free insiders list today. Hey, thanks for listening. Listen, I have a big favor to ask you, and it will only take 30 seconds or less, and it would mean a huge amount to me. If you like this podcast, please let me know. Please let the team I work with know. Please let my guests know, and you can do this easily by subscribing to the podcast. It's probably the biggest favor you could do for me right now, and it's really simple. Just go to iTunes, search for The James Altucher Show, and click subscribe. Again, it will only take you 30 seconds or less. And if you subscribe now, it will really help me out a lot. Thanks again. AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power. So how do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud. Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing, and of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less, like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, Take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash advance. That's oracle.com slash advance. oracle.com slash advance.